Good morning. It's good to see you all here this morning. Um, we are in Luke chapter 5 in our study this morning. Um, I wanted to um, remind you when we, when we chose this line of study, um, it wasn't just to have consistent you know, topic from week to week. Um, the, the purpose of this study was really to have something that we could do at home um, as well as the people who are at home who aren't, um, you know, aren't here, able to be here with us, um, but that we can have a, a line of study throughout the week. It's not just a Sunday study. It, it's it's a, a all throughout the, the, the week study, right? Um, so I just wanted to remind you of that and uh, encourage you to be, be studying. Uh, I, what I do <clears throat> is just read the chapter over and over and over again throughout the week, and I find that you know, the spirit stirs new things in me. I glean new things out of it. Um, um, sometimes I'll read, you know, chapters before and after to get more context or whatever. But whatever works for you, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, it, it's it's um, it, it's not just this is not just a Sunday study, right? That's why we have the discussions uh, afterwards, so we can talk about what uh, what we've seen in the scripture uh, through the week. So I just want to remind you of that, encourage you, keep. Um, keep studying, um, you know, throughout the week. See, see what the Spirit does. Um, anything else? I think that's good. Our Father God, you are our Lord. You are our King. You are our Master. You are our Father. We come before you today gathering together with the strength that we have of praising you together. Um, Lord, we're all in different stages and different troubles uh, in life and different uh, um, experiences of joy throughout the week. And, but we have this one thing that we can do together, and that's praise you. So we thank you for that. We thank you for that chance, so that opportunity. Um, we pray that, that this doesn't become just a ritual for us, but it is truly an expression from our heart to yours, Lord, and, and our thankfulness, our humility before you. Thank you, Lord. It's through Jesus that we pray, because of him, that, that we can even speak with you. Amen. It's good that we can meet once again uh, to share in this ritual together. And it, uh, it truly does define who we are as a people, and it defines what we believe. And so uh, we're blessed to be able to do this again today. Just a reading from the letter of First John. He writes this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. It's an amazing thought that God came down and became one of us flesh and blood, and he gave that on our behalf. And so we have this new relationship with God through him. And so let's be thankful once again today. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for this memorial. It reminds us of your condescending to us and becoming one of us and giving yourself on our behalf. We're thankful. We're thankful for this bread which reminds us that you became flesh and blood and that your body was broken on our behalf. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
And for this cup, Lord God, we thank you, which is the, the cup of the new covenant in his blood. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin, which makes life possible for us. We're grateful. We're thankful for each other. We're thankful for all good things. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Mike said, we are in Luke chapter 5 this morning, so you might want to be turning there in your Bibles. And the theme for the message this morning is based on verses 11 and 28. Uh, Luke tells two stories in this chapter that end in exactly the same way. The first one um, is at the beginning of the chapter. Jesus gets into the boat of Simon Peter. Evidently, James and John are there too. And uh, these men are fishermen, and uh, Jesus tells them to go out into the lake and uh, let their nets down for a catch. And they've been fishing all night, Peter says, and they haven't caught a thing. And he is the expert. He's a professional at this, so he doesn't understand why Jesus is saying this, but he, he goes ahead and does it. And lo and behold, they bring in a miraculous catch of fish. And Peter responds by uh, saying, Lord, get away from me. I'm a sinful man. And uh, Jesus says, do not fear. From now on, I will make you fishers of men. 
And Peter and James and John are all just astounded by what Jesus has done. And they, uh, verse 11 says, when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Um, you know, that was, uh, that was an interesting response. Uh, remember, this was the biggest catch of fish these men have ever taken. And that, that represented a lot of income. And yet what they realized was that what that miraculous catch of fish revealed about Jesus was far more important than the income it represented. And so their attitude was, forget about the money. I want the man. And they left everything. And then later in verse 27, Luke tells us that Jesus was walking along and he saw Matthew Levi, a tax collector, sitting in his tax booth. And Jesus said to him, follow me. And lo and behold, he did. Verse uh, 28, Luke says that he left everything behind and got up and began to follow Jesus. Now, again, this was a sacrifice. Uh, tax collectors were uh, generally wealthy people. Uh, tax collecting was a lucrative career. And yet, uh, Matthew just leaves it all behind. And this was most likely uh, going to have permanent consequences. It's not likely that Matthew would be able to change his mind later on if he wanted to and come back and say, can I have my old job back? No, this, that, this was a permanent decision, and he was forever turning his back on a lucrative lifestyle that he had gotten very accustomed to in order to follow Jesus. Both cases, they left everything to follow the Lord. And these examples uh, set a pattern for us. This is what God, in, uh, God expects of us when we become disciples of Jesus. We are to leave everything to follow him. But what does that mean? What does that mean for you and me? That's what I want us to think about for a few minutes this morning. And let's just start by looking at Jesus himself, because as always, Jesus is our example. And Jesus never asks us to do anything that he hasn't done himself. Uh, Jesus left everything, did he not? Paul tells us about that in Philippians chapter 2. Notice what he says beginning in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being found or being made in the likeness of men I'm sorry but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being found in the likeness of men being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross what is it that Jesus gave up what did Jesus leave behind well, he gave up equality with God, Paul says. He gave up the form of God. He gave up heaven itself. Uh, to sum it all up, you could say he gave up his rights and privileges as deity. Leaving everything prepared Jesus for a life of total dependence on the Father, a life in which he would be so obedient to the Father that he would be willing even to go to the cross. Now, what about us? Well, it basically means the same thing. For us to leave everything means that we empty ourselves, just as Jesus emptied himself. It means we give up our rights. We give up our privileges. Jesus talks about this in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 38 and following. He says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, 
do not resist an evil person. But if anyone uh, slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever, wants, uh, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you. And do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, if you were here a couple of years ago when we were going through the Sermon on the Mount and we looked at this text, you might remember that uh, uh, verse 39 can be translated in different ways. Uh, my version, the New American Standard, uh, says, uh, you have heard that it was said, uh, uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evil person. The word person is not actually in the original Greek. The translators added that because they thought that's what Jesus meant. The King James simply says, do not resist evil. But there's also another possible translation, and that is, do not resist with evil means. And not only is that an equally legitimate translation, I believe it's more consistent with Jesus' teaching elsewhere and the own, uh, his own example in his ministry. Because Jesus resisted evil, and Jesus resisted evil people. Jesus uh, certainly resisted Satan. He did that in the, uh, the last chapter we looked at in the temptation with the devil in the wilderness. Jesus resisted the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus resisted the money changers in the temple. Jesus was all about resisting evil. But what he did teach is that we are not to resist in an evil way. We're not to respond to evil with more evil. We're not to retaliate. We're not to... Um, uh, we're not to respond in kind. We're not to take vengeance. Uh, just like uh, Peter says of Jesus himself later uh, at the cross. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. And P uh, Paul talks about the same thing in Romans chapter 12. We're not to seek vengeance ourselves. That is God's job. We're to leave that in his hands. But instead, we're to bless those who curse us. And we are to... Do good to those who persecute us. Don't respond with evil means. But instead, when someone offends you, when someone insults you, when someone takes advantage of you, uh, Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Let them have even more than what they're trying to take by force. And, uh, and so what Jesus is getting at here is that to live in the kingdom of God, to be a follower of Jesus, means that we leave everything in the sense that we give up our rights. We give up our privileges. And that is so opposite from what our society tells us, isn't it? Our society says, you stand up for yourself. Uh, you insist on your rights. Make sure you don't let anybody ever take advantage of you. And if they try, then you take them to court. Jesus says that is not how we do things in my kingdom. In my kingdom, we relinquish our rights. And uh, now that's a, a lofty goal, but that is to be our aim. And, of course, we don't do it perfectly. You know, we just saying, uh, I surrender all. Uh, I think uh, a number of our songs that, that we sing express an ideal uh, that we are shooting for rather than something we've already accomplished because, uh, trust me, we have not surrendered everything. We, we want to. We, we pray for that ability, and we're constantly moving in that direction. But growing in Christ means that the Holy Spirit is constantly revealing to us new areas of our life that we have not yet surrendered to God. And so when he does that, we thank him for revealing what was in us, and we give that over to God and say, okay, Lord, I don't, I don't want to hold on to this. I want to give this to you. I want to surrender this to you. And then we go on, and eventually the Holy Spirit reveals something else to us. You're still holding on to these rights. You've got to give that up too. And so we try to do that. But it's a lifelong process. We are constantly... Uh, in the process of surrendering more and more to God. And, and I realize that if, uh, if, to someone who is not spiritually minded, uh, that sounds like a dreadful thing. It sounds like uh, 
something that you wouldn't want to do at all. Why in the world would you want to give up your rights? And yet, for someone who understands what God is actually offering and the treasure that awaits those who go down this path, they, they realize that uh, this, this is the way to true joy and it is the way to real freedom. As long as I'm holding on to my rights, I am at the mercy of other people because I am a slave to anyone who comes along and pushes my buttons and does something that offends me, that makes me angry, because then uh, I've lost my peace. I've lost my joy because of them, or rather because of the way I responded to them and the fact that I am insisting that, that things go my way. I'm insisting on my rights. And so when someone else infringes on my rights, then I lose my peace. And Jesus is trying to free us of that. And he's saying, look, I've got a better way for you. I know it's not, uh, it's not fun to go through this painful process of giving up your rights, but that is the path of joy and freedom. When, and as I said, we don't do this perfectly, and we're constantly uh, trying to, to get to, the, uh, to where Jesus was. But when we do, then we will have reached a place where we are personally unoffendable, where no one can say anything or do anything that would personally offend me. Now, I'm not talking about... Uh, being offended by the injustices of the world or seeing an innocent person over here suffer. Uh, th there is a place for righteous indignation at, uh, at evil and injustice in the world. But I'm talking about personal offenses against me. If I am living completely like Jesus, I, I don't get offended. Because when someone infringes on my rights or tries to, it has no effect. Because I don't have any rights. I've given those up. I've handed those over to the Lord. So there is nothing you can do to take away my peace. Now that is freedom. And that's where God is inviting us to live. That's what the Lord wants for us. And uh, this, is, this is all a part of emptying ourselves, which again is what Jesus did and we, what he calls us to do. I think it was A.W. Tozer, Tozer who said that you can only be filled um, to the degree that you've been emptied, uh, which makes perfect sense. And uh, you know, our goal should be to be filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, Ephesians 5.19. Uh, or Paul prays in Ephesians 3.19 that we would all be filled up to, the, to all the fullness of God. Think about that. Sometime when you've got a little time to meditate, Ephesians 3.19, he prays that his readers would be filled up to all the fullness of God. But we can't be filled with God or filled with his spirit uh, until we empty ourselves. Now, as, as I said, we do that gradually. But the more we empty ourselves, the more we give up our rights, the more he's able to fill us with himself. And my goodness, what a bargain. To give up my rights or to, uh, to give up my attachment to things in order to be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, there's, uh, there's much more that we could say, but let's go ahead and move into our uh, group discussion here. Let me put this other mic on. And I want to just uh, begin by asking you, because I want to, I want to make this uh, practical and personal and uh, to see how this applies to, to us as individuals. And so let me ask you to think about uh, something, maybe, maybe this is a good way to do it. What is one of your pet peeves? What is something that uh, someone else could do that just upsets you or aggravates you to no end? Maybe something that just uh, makes you blow up with anger. Uh, 
because normally, if you look into the reasons for it, what you'll find is someone has infringed on your rights. Uh, did I see a hand up somewhere? Oh, somebody was making a motion. But... Okay, go ahead, Jenny. Tailgating. Tailgating. Somebody, okay. Oh, somebody who tailgates oh. me. <laughs> okay. Tailgating, yes. Makes me late to something. Someone who makes me late. Someone who makes you late. You wouldn't have anybody specific in mind. <laughs> Just in general, someone makes you late. Okay. <laughs> yes, very good. Okay, there. Mine used to be when someone stole something from me. Hmm. But after dealing with the group that I deal with now, and seeing different things happen, it just doesn't affect you as much as it anymore. You know? Some of the guys stole something recently uh, from the building, but it's like, you know what? I hate that it happened. We'll look into it, but let's keep moving. It was actually zero emotion at this point. Okay, <laughs> so you're, you're seeing progress and, yeah. and letting go of that right. Okay, that's good. Uh, Okay, back here, Tristan. When someone chews with their mouth open. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Somebody else. All right. Well, those those are good examples, and uh, with most of them, at least, I think you can you can easily see why. Uh, our getting upset in those situations is the result of someone infringing on my rights. I feel like I have a right to be on time. And when someone interferes with that and makes me late, then uh, you know, they've, they've taken away that right. They've infringed on my right. And I feel cheated. I feel like uh, I've been taken advantage of. Uh, or someone tailgates me. I feel like I've got a right to my space on the highway and people need to back off, right? They're infringing on my space, my rights. And uh, there, yeah, I, I can think of another number of other examples in, uh, when it comes to traffic situations that, that can set us off uh, a lot of times, right? But uh, uh, I'll share one uh, of mine with you and, and uh, like Daryl I think this is an area where I used to be much worse than I am now I, I have seen progress thankfully in in this area but it used to be uh, very aggravating to me when I would uh, when I would be uh, interrupted and not be able to do what I had planned to do I was very protective of my time my schedule uh, my appointment book, and if something came up and somebody asked me to do something that wasn't on my schedule and I had to leave undone the things I had planned, that, uh, that was one of the things that just uh, really got to me. Now, thankfully, I am doing a lot better because I have learned that uh, my time, my time is not really my time. It is God's time. It all belongs to Him, and my whole life is His to do with what He wants. And so it, uh, it has been a process, but I have learned to let go of my, my schedule, my plans. Um, and I hesitated to mention that because I don't want anyone leaving here thinking, well, now I know I can't call Todd. <laughs> I can't ask Todd to do anything for me because he's going to be offended. No, that is not my purpose. I'm just trying to be honest. And I, I want you to do that. If you need something, then call me. I need more practice. <laughs> I need more, uh, uh, more practice in letting go of my schedule. But, uh, but anyway, I think those, uh, again, if we surrender our rights, then we get to that place where we cannot be offended by someone. We, no one else has the power to make me angry. No one has the power to take away my peace. And... That, that is real freedom. Daryl? Yeah, the first thing I thought about when you said that the scripture was Stephen in Acts chapter 7. 
Okay. He uh, was uh, getting stone, stoned. He asked those. He asked God to forgive him, yeah. forgive those that were stoning him, and he was free. He was happy. He said, "I see uh, Jesus, the Son of Man, next to our Lord." He was, mm -hmm. "I'm ready to go." So uh, we can get like that. All the rest of the little stuff in life it won't, won't be a problem. Right. Yeah. yeah, he had surrendered his right to living, and that's uh, that's a pretty big one, isn't it? They were taking away his very right to life, and yet his attitude was, God forgive them. My life belongs to the Lord, and I want what is best for my enemies. That's what uh, Jesus modeled too. Any other thoughts? Ready? Mike? Okay. When um, God told Peter to, to to let down the nets, and they had been out there all night, and Peter, you know, he said, nevertheless, at your will, I'll do it. And, and I think about that in our, in our life circumstances. We normally operate in these five senses that we have. But faith is a different sense. And, mm -hmm. and Peter, though it did not really make sense to him, he was willing to do, I'll call it intuition. He was willing to do what God told him to do. So, so we, a lot of times we operate in these five senses, which is why we get so offended. But if we operate in God's faith and are willing to do something that God is showing us to do, even though it may not even make sense to people around us, the outcome is, is, is usually better than, than we expect it to be. And this is what happened in this case, he said, We've been out here all night. This doesn't make sense. This is what you said earlier. I'm the professional. This is what I do. However, because God has told me to look at this a different way, he was willing to, I guess, take the chance and say, I'll, I'll follow that, that yeah. faith versus my, my senses. So that's, that's what I got out of that, just following God in a, in a very different way where, where faith is really taking over versus what I can see, smell, touch, hear, and, and see. So. Yeah. Good. And that's, uh, An extremely important lesson, too, because uh, God uh, often asks us to do things that don't make sense to us, at least in my experience. <laughs> um, and, of course, if we are just uh, living in, in the flesh and we're not living by faith, if we're just trying to go by what's logical and what we can see, um, then, then the temptation is, well, that doesn't make any sense. I'm not about to do that. And yet, um, I think something else that Peter's example here shows us is that you can, the crucial thing is that you've got enough faith to obey. Uh, he evidently had no confidence that, that this was going to work. <laughs> um, he, he told Jesus that basically... Uh, you know, We've already done this. This is futile. But he had enough faith to obey. His, he had enough submission to say, because you said so, for no other reason, not because I think this is going to be effective, but because you said so, I will do it. And if you've got enough faith and submission to obey, then don't, don't worry so much about uh, questioning the outcome. Because that, uh, that's God's department. Just have enough submission, have enough faith to obey when God asks you to do something. And uh, uh, it will be life-changing. It, it, that, it, that itself will grow your faith. Your confidence in, in God's ability to work out the, uh, the outcome uh, will, will grow exponentially as you see him actually do it. When you step out in faith and do what he says, uh, miraculous results, then your faith grows so that the next time you don't just have the faith to obey, you, al you also have a lot more confidence that this is going to uh, accomplish what, uh, what God says it will. All right. Good, good observation. Somebody else? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Mike. So 
end of Luke chapter 5 is the, the parable that Jesus tells about the new wineskin and old wineskin and the new cloth and the old cloth. And I never understood that context. Why, what does that mean? I mean, I understand the principle, but what is he trying to tell us? Um, and, and as I was reading that this week, I, I think the light bulb went off. You know, I, I guess I used to say that was my intelligence figuring things out. Now I'll say, I think God revealed something to me. Um, okay. What, one thing I noticed is that in some of the versions, like I'm looking at the NIV, it, at verse 33, it's got a new heading, like it's a new topic. I don't think it's a new topic. I think that parable goes all the way back to the, this is the same event that he's having with uh, the banquet with Levi, and he's eating with tax collectors and sinners, right? And he, um, they, the, the, the scribes and Pharisees ask him, why do you do that? And, and he says it's um, not, the, uh, you know, not the healthy that need the doctor. Um, I've come not to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. One of the versions I read, by the way, said, I, I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners. I thought, I thought that's a, an interesting uh, translation there. But um, anyway, so it's in that topic of, of am, am, I a, you know, am I a righteous, a self-righteous or a sinner type person? Um, and, and when I realize it's all in that same context, what I think he's saying is I think he's saying that the, the new wine is Jesus' message, the gospel, the new message. And the old wineskin and the new wineskin are those two types of people, the, the, the people that hear it and the people that don't hear it. So if you think of it in that context, listen, listen to the way it reads. If, if the wine is, is Jesus' message and the old wineskins are these Pharisees who aren't listening, um, okay. listen to it in this context. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the wineskins, and the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one, af no one, after drinking old wine, wants the new, for they say the old is better. Um, I see that as he's describing the opposite of what your message was, the people who are willing to give everything. These old wineskins are the people that don't want to let go of what they have don't want to hear his message yeah that that's kind of the light bulb that went off for me hmm. in this oh, so i would I, I wouldn't mind hearing some other context if someone else sees something hmm. else in there or differently but that's that's what i saw in it this week okay well i appreciate your sharing that that's an uh, an interesting uh interesting spin on that i don't guess i'd thought of uh, connecting it quite that way but that's that's a good possibility. Hmm. I, have a, I have a study Bible, and, and it says for five, um, verse 539, Jesus pointed out that someone who likes old wine will not even try new wine, since such a person is satisfied with the old. This analogy explained why someone in Israel had trouble turning to Jesus. Hmm. Okay, well, that's very similar to... What Mike just said. Anybody else? Adam? Also, I think the, the garment part before might illuminate it a little bit. So like building on what Lisa said, the, the ways of the, the Jewish people in the old, uh, you don't take new new garment patch and patch it onto the old you know it would you be ruining the new so you know something totally new yeah yep that's good yeah yeah, uh, he was just saying that the old versus the New Testament would come into play there in that in that aspect. Yep. Well, all right. Appreciate the comments. Um, I usually 
uh, try to offer some kind of practical application to go along with the lesson, so let me just do something right quick. Uh, getting back to the idea of uh, holding on to our rights versus uh, surrendering those, uh, let me suggest that you do something uh, every night this week. You might have to make yourself a post-it note and put it on your pillow or something to remind you, but before you go to sleep, each night, think back over the day and ask yourself, when did I get angry today? When was I aggravated? When was I upset? And then, if you th think of a time, then uh, ask yourself the next question. What, uh, what was the reason for that? Why did I get upset over that conversation or that action, whatever it was? And I think you can test this and... Try it out for yourself. I think what you will generally find is it traces back to someone infringed on your rights. And so when you make that discovery, then uh, hand, hand that over to God. Pray about it and say, Lord, I, I want to let this go. And uh, as, you, as you do that, if you make this a consistent habit, that I think the goal would be that eventually, it, this won't just be something that you, um, you do at night and review and say, well, I blew it there because of this, but you'll get to the point where in the moment when it's about to happen, you will begin to be conscious. Well, this, this is a situation where someone is infringing on my rights, but hey, I don't have to respond with anger. I don't have to get upset about this because I have surrendered my rights and there is no reason to get angry. So uh, just try that this week and uh, uh, try a little self-examination each night and about this particular topic and uh, see if that uh, enlightens you at all and helps you in that, in that process. Chuck? Sorry, we all can say he or she made me angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Uh, biblically speaking, nobody can make you angry. That is a choice that you make. That is your own, uh, own response over which you have control. All right. Good. Good point.
Good to see everyone this morning. Um, you're a blessing to everyone else in this room uh, just by being here. We encourage one another in our faith and uh, worshiping God together is, is such a blessing. Uh, a few announcements. Grab a bulletin if you want to know what's going on. Jennifer is starting to fill it up with uh, all sorts of information. Uh, so grab one off the back end. Children, if you're a tween or a teen, or if you've taken the bulletin challenge that's back there, the children's bulletin, and uh, filled it out, it says here, uh, if you completed it, see Jennifer. Right, Jennifer? Okay. Um, next week on the 21st, uh, we will start children's worship. And uh, if you would like to uh, participate in that, uh, please see Janelle. And um, was there one other thing, Janelle? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, and the nursery. And, it, and if you're willing to help out in the nursery, uh, please see Janelle, and she'll put a schedule together. But we, uh, we want to start providing... Uh, some lessons and our intent is to follow uh, the Luke, Luke uh, study as we are with our as we're doing here so that our children will be paralleling and and you can study with your children at home uh, so we'll be doing that during uh, youth worship okay uh, glad uh, to see Mary Tori is with us she had a rough couple weeks uh, not just physically, but uh, with, with uh, her vehicle and such. Uh, uh, Mary, we're happy things are settled down for you. Um, Katie is home. Had, we, talk, we talked about her in the last couple of weeks. Uh, she will be bedridden um, from her surgery and recovering from that. So keep her in your prayers as well. And... Uh, Johnny's daughter, uh, Kayla, Johnny ordered uh, a sweater jacket for Kayla, and uh, there were some issues from where he got it from, and uh, so now he's getting a new one, but he also gets to keep the old one, and he'd like to uh, donate this uh, to any young lady in here at church uh, that would want this little jacket, and uh, so see Johnny after services for that, okay. Um, I think that's it. Why don't we go to God in prayer. Okay. Father, thank you for today. Todd had a hard lesson uh, about giving up our, our freedoms, giving up our rights. And we know, Father, it takes a lifetime to, to, to learn that and do that. We all have different buttons that people push, Father, and we react. We like to blame it on our heritage and our parents on how we act, but no, we're in control and we have to make the choice. But we know you give us the power through your spirit to resist lashing out and responding and retaliating and uh, meeting evil with evil. Uh, we know we're not to do that, Father, but it's hard sometimes. It's so hard because it, we do it naturally. But we don't live in the naturally, Father. We, we live in the spirit. And when we're in the spiritual life, the spiritual realm, and, Father, in your kingdom, not this place. So we beg you, Father, to help us. Help us in the things, the challenges, the buttons that people push. Help us to resist the temptation and, and, and do what Christ would do. Do what Christ would do. Father, you came down to this earth and Jesus took our form. Well, we long for the time to be in that spiritual form, that heavenly body that you're going to give us when we're with you, to be in your presence, 
to worship and glorify you unendingly, to live with you forever and ever and ever. With no pain and suffering and evil and wickedness amongst our, around us because we'll be in your presence, a place of holiness and righteousness and purity and perfectness. We just stand in awe of what that's going to be and how that would feel and what it would look like. Until that time, Father, give us strength. Give us the desire. Give us the passion to live as Christ lived. And when we fail, forgive us, Father, because we need your, your mercy and your grace constantly through Christ our Lord. We praise you for the sun that shines and the needs that you meet every day for us. Whether it's food or rest or warmth, we praise you, Father, because all things, all good things come from you, and we know that. So thank you. Bless our brothers and sisters to their needs, physical and spiritual. Father, we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.